Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Security Flash. My name is Casey Ellis. I'm the founder, chairman, and CTO of BugCrowd. Uh, today, we're going to be talking, as most other people are talking about right now, the Log4j2 vulnerability, uh, CVE 2021-44228. Um, so a couple of things we're going to go through, uh, why we think it's bad, um, how it works, uh, what to do about it, and then what we see happening uh, in terms of malicious active behavior and, and use of this vulnerability in the wild um, over the coming weeks. Um, so firstly, why it's bad. Um, you know, it's not uncommon uh, at this point for, for the security community to, to kind of freak out and raise a big noise around a particular vulnerability that gets announced. Um, this particular time, I think it's absolutely justified. Uh, this particular issue has a lot of different traits to it that make it <clears throat> quite pervasive, quite difficult to fix. And, and very easy and useful to, a, to an attacker. So let's go through those. Uh, Log4j is a, is a Java library that does logging, as, as the name implies. Um, it's everywhere, basically. Uh, it, it's a really, really common um, inclusion. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, Java applications and even Java systems that will just pull it down um, without it necessarily being obvious that they're doing that. It's something that's just al almost always there. Um, what that means is that it can be difficult to find. There's, there's going to be applications and systems that, you know, you know, have log4j in them, and then there's going to be a whole bunch of others that, that might not be as obvious. So that's the first one. The second is that it's oftentimes deeply embedded, um, which tends to make it difficult to fix. So if you've got a library like this that has a whole bunch of other things talking to it or built on top of it, hanging off it, you know, dependencies in that sort of sense, the challenge with just running the update, which is available, by the way, uh, to, to mitigate this issue is that you don't know what that update's going to break potentially within your application. So that makes it difficult to, to fix and you can already see how this is compounding out. Like we don't know where it is and if we did know where it was, it would be difficult to fix because we have to go through regression for each one of those things of it that we find. So we're already in a bit of trouble. Um, it's simple to exploit. The, the actual first stage payload fits in a tweet. Um, and that's not always true uh, with, with, with these types of vulnerabilities that can be so, so impactful, but it certainly is with this one. Um, the simplicity of exploitation is also meaning that it's, it's accessible to all sorts of different ranges of sophistication in terms of attacker. So from the, from the very basic, even like the newcomer who's completely opportunistic, right up to the extremely sophisticated, they all have the ability to, uh, to take this thing and use it quite quickly. Um, the fourth is that it's very flexible in terms of triggering. Uh, when you think about what logging is and what it does, almost by design, it's listening to a whole bunch of different possible things that it would need to log and then, and then storing those things. So you know, all of those different ways that you can trigger a log to be generated um, is potentially uh, an input that can be used to actually trigger the exploit. Um, this is different to, say, a vulnerability in a web server where you've got to do a specific thing to a specific port to make the web server do the exploit um, or, or to trigger the exploit that you've, you've, you've written. Um, or, you know, there, there's all sorts of different variations. Uh, you know, more, more typically this idea of it being so deeply bedded into an application that there's all sorts of different paths to cause it to fire. That's not all that common. Um, it does happen, but it's not something that happens very often. Um, that actually makes it you know, quite dangerous in terms of you know, the, uh, the flexibility it provides an adversary. Uh, if you've got a particular way in that you wanted to use and that way is blocked by a mitigation, there are other, there are other paths uh, basically at that point. And, and there's so many of them with this one that it's, it's quite a challenge. Um, the fifth one is that it's very flexible in terms of the impact options available uh, to an exploit. So I'll get into this in, in the next bit around how it works or how the exploit works. But suffice to say, if you trigger the initial um, stage of the exploit, you've got a lot of ability to do different things, exfiltration and so on. Um, if you're able to actually successfully execute on the second stage, then you've basically got remote code execution on, on the system that you've just attacked, which is incredibly flexible. At that point, you can do almost whatever you want. Um, <clears throat> and this is a challenge that makes it very attractive to, to, to the adversary uh, because you know, that section of, that second section that I just mentioned of, 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 the, uh, of the exploitation process around this issue, that's where most of the focus for research and development is happening right now. So we can expect that that stage will get more stable 
and more useful as time goes by. All right, so how does it work? Uh, wh what's actually going on here? So Log4j uh, log, log rather um, has a concept called lookups. Uh, this is where JD and I comes into it. And those lookups are triggered by the logs themselves. There's specially crafted uh, strings within, within the logs that you know, basically log4j will look at and say, okay, that's a lookup. I need to go off and retrieve a thing. The problem is that that retrieval process isn't sanitized. And also it's kind of arbitrary. You can get it to, to do that lookup in all sorts of different ways and actually insert behaviors and actions into that lookup that probably weren't intended uh, for, for a logging tool. Um, and going back to what I was saying before around the, uh, the many roads to Rome problem on this one, you know, to trigger this vulnerability, you only need to write a log that creates the exploit code, um, the actual lookup takes care of the rest of, of the, uh, the, the chain uh, or the exploit itself, or exploitation of this vulnerability. So, you know, as I said before, there's lots of ways to get a log into a system, uh, depending on what that system is. It's not just, you know, sending a get request to a website or whatever else, there's many roads to roam. Um, we've actually seen people working on exploitation of this issue through a malicious um, SSID on an access point over Wi-Fi, for example. Um, I've actually seen it trigger through through a mail server uh, and, and mail filtering tools. There's a long list of ways that you can cause this thing to, to fire off and um, that's, that's inherently fairly challenging. Um, <clears throat> so that gets you through to the first stage. This is the actual like core nature of the vulnerability itself. It, it's that um, unsanitized lookup uh, that you can you can get to do things that it was probably never meant to do in the first place. Um, that first stage can also perform certain commands uh, and, and you know, basically reveal or exfiltrate information. We've seen that first stage used on its own for exploit, uh, exfiltration of environment variables, for example, like AWS keys, um, the content of a password shadow file. Um, there's a lot of access to sensitive information that's possible just through that first piece. Um, but one of the other things you can get it to do is to reach out somewhere pull down a second stage and actually include that into the Java, the main kind of parent Java file as a class, at which point as an attacker, you've got remote code execution. And, and really that package can be, you know, theoretically whatever you want it to be. Um, going back to what I was saying before, those, those second stages, that second part of the process is inherently a lot more fragile because uh, it's going to depend on the environment. It's going to depend on what other software is there. Like all sorts of different things can cause that second stage to be, you know, less robust and less dependable than the first one. Um, but a lot of work is going into making it more resilient and more reliable at the moment. And that's both on the, uh, the uh, good faith bounty hunter and, and security researcher side of things, as well as presumably the, uh, the bad guys that are going to end up causing some havoc around this as well. So that's how it works. And, you know, I wanted to kind of spell that out because I've heard a lot of confusion um, on, on, you know, that particular aspect of it, uh, you know, is there a second stage? Is there a first stage? Is this all over LDAP? You know, all of those different things. Like the answer is there are multiple stages. It's not just over LDAP. It's not just a web request that will trigger it. It's a fairly flexible and deeply embedded vulnerability that I think we're going to be dealing with for quite a long time. So, <clears throat> all right, what do we do about all this, right? Um, from my perspective, there's two classes of fix. There's one where you address the root cause and the other is where you mitigate the overall risk um, in terms of you know, an assumption that you aren't gonna necessarily find all of these things or be able to patch all of these things within your environment straight away. So what else can you do on top of that? So we'll go to the root cause ones first. Where you know log4j exists, which I've already said about five times now is kind of problematic, but you know, assuming that you do have uh, areas in your environment where you do know exists, go patch those things, um, work out whatever you need to from a regression standpoint and, and deploy a patch as quickly as you can. Um, if a dependency or, or you know, regression, all those sorts of things that can prevent a person from actually applying a patch stops you from, from doing that in a, in a quick way, um, you can mitigate the exploit by disabling lookups in log4j and we'll actually post a link on how to do that uh, underneath uh, this, uh, this video. Um, that's not resolving the code itself, but what it's doing is it's basically taking out the, the, the piece of the process where you know, log4j will actually execute the, uh, the, the payload itself. So it's you know, definitely a good way to, to mitigate the risk on a per system basis. 
Um, once you're done patching and applying workarounds, so you've gone through your big list of log4j things that you think you have and, and tick them all off, it's pretty safe to assume that you've missed a bunch of stuff. Um, so performing discovery across your code repos, across your live systems, across your environment, just in general, with the express intent of, of targeting like previously unidentified or unknown log4j instances, um, that's a good idea. Um, generally in that process, you're gonna find a lot of vendor stuff uh, so, so third-party software that's within your environment um, where patches might not have been released uh, to, to mitigate this yet because they're going through the same thing. They're doing regression testing and, and trying to work out how to, how to sort it out themselves. Um, I think there's going to be a few cycles of this. Uh, so really, I've, I've actually, in my notes, I've got this written down as a go-to 10 as, as kind of you know, the last step in the process. Um, just continuing to do that until you feel like you've, you've got it you know, fully in hand or as well in hand as you can, you can get it. Which brings me to mitigations, um, because you know again, it's very flexible. It's very easy to exploit. It's very um, there, there are multiple paths to exploitation. Once you've got it, there's a lot you can do with it, and it's difficult to fix. Let's assume that we can't do that fully. So, what can you do from a mitigation standpoint? Uh, one of the recommendations that came out of CISA today, um, it was Jen, Jen Easterly who posted it earlier on. I think it's spot on point and and very good advice is that. You should be ensuring that your SOC or whoever's looking at logs from a blue team standpoint from, for your organization is burning down every event and incident that targets systems that you know contain a vulnerable instance of log4j. Um, at this point in time, you know it's it's fairly safe to say that if if there's been an exploit run against a system uh, that you know to be vulnerable, uh, you're going to have to do incident response. On, on, on that system. So making sure you're prioritizing that and, and preventing lateral movement and so on, um, that's actually becoming a defensive. It's, it's normally kind of a cleanup thing, but at this point it's a defensive one. That's normally a cleanup thing, but at this point it's a, it's a defensive one. So first things first, make sure that your SOC and your response teams understand where you believe there to be log4j in your environment and, and prioritizing incidents or suspected incidents that target those particular systems. So that's, that's step one. The second is to apply WAF rules. And, and the main purpose of doing this is to reduce the noise. Um, you know, what we've seen, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, it's quite simple to exploit. This, this exploit is in the hands of a whole lot of people that, that actually aren't um, that sophisticated. So they're just kind of spraying it everywhere, right? Um, but they're also not necessarily modifying what's in the uh, the exploit string itself, which makes it quite easy to block uh, at the at the web application firewall layer if they're using web to to deliver the uh, the payload and the exploit. So that's a pretty good step to basically reduce the noise. Like you you'll cut out the opportunistic and the unsophisticated attackers. It is important to call out that this won't stop the folks that are sophisticated or determined. Um, they're going to keep on finding ways around that. And again, there's so many ways to write a log file that you know you can reasonably expect that they would eventually be successful if a WAF rule is all you deploy. So just it's important to think about it like that. But this really does justify a defense in depth strategy, uh, and that's one of the uh, you know quick wins that you can apply to your environment. Um, yeah, and a lot of R and D is being put into filter evasion. Like some of the some of the different ways to bypass. You think about the job of the adversary if you put up a rule that blocks a known thing, and then they realize that that's happening, what do you do as a hacker? You figure out a way around that. And that applies to, to, the, uh, to the white hats and the, the bounty hunting world as much as it does to the adversary. Um, so that's the second one. The third one is to block firewall, uh, to apply firewall rules rather, to uh, basically block uh, JD&I lookout, lookups out of your network. Um, it, that can happen across all sorts of different protocols. So I'd recommend you actually look at JD&I itself and, and get an understanding of how uh, these, these type of lookups can, can exit a network. Um, but blocking them on the way out when they're not necessary, uh, what that will do is it'll limit the ability for the first stage to exfiltrate information. So there's a win there already. Um, what it'll also do is prevent the ability to, for a successful exploit to retrieve a payload um, to, to get remote code execution and do other, you know, potentially more damaging things. So again, not a complete solution, but if you're thinking about it through the lens of defense in depth, um, it's actually one of the places that I would start. Um, just assuming that, you know, this thing gets loose and 
and uh, you know, you've got uh, successful exploitation in your environment, if you apply that thinking to it for a moment and start there, then these are actually the, the things that you probably want to do first, even maybe before you go off and patch a bunch of stuff. Um, so yeah, those are, those are some recommendations from, from a mitigation standpoint. In terms of where it goes from here, um, yeah, really what we've seen happen, uh, aside from a ton of hunters, you know, jumping in and helping out our clients, helping us out with our clients, even doing, you know, collaborative R&D to try to figure out, you know, what are the edges of this thing and, and how does that all kind of roll forward? Um, there's been a massive amount of that and that started off basically straight away. Um, we saw crypto miners start to hitch their tools to to log4j shell as a uh, as a way to deliver crypto mining onto systems uh, around about midday on Friday Pacific time um, and then later on that day we started to see botnet herders um, do the same thing so there's definitely a lot of opportun opportunistic cybercrime um, kind of basically jumping into the gold rush is, is really what we saw as an initial phase of exploitation around this. And some of those would have been blocked by WAFs and, and different other things, but the ones that are more sophisticated, as I said before, will eventually find their way around that stuff if you're, uh, if you're not burning down the vulnerability itself. Um, what's happened over the past 24 hours or so is the, uh, the ransomware operators have, you know, quote unquote, entered the chat. Um, what's being reported there is that they're using uh, log for shell as a way to traverse inside environments where they already have access. So they may not have even deployed ransomware yet um, within that environment, but they're trying to get a better feel for, you know, how successful their ransomware would be if they were to deploy it. Um, there's a fair bit of recon happening uh, out of, out of um, actors that appear to have that particular motivation. Uh, so that's kind of scary, but um, good to know. Um, I think what that means is that for for organizations from a blue team and a logging standpoint, you know, you're gonna see a ton of this um, exploit being attempted at the very least on, on the outside. So if you've got internet facing assets, if you go through your logs, you'll see tons of it. Um, less so inside your network. Um, so if, you're, if you've got segmented systems or if you've got a, a traditional corporate network with the, you know, the crunchy shell, uh, if you happen to have a soft center and you see it, uh, bouncing around inside your organization, then it's safe to assume that something bad's happened. And, and that's something that is probably fairly high signal for triggering off a, a, a deeper incident response process at that point in time. So that's um, a couple of the things that we're seeing out in, in bad guy land, so to speak. Um, you know, where I see this going from here, we've already seen a lot of work done on, on evasions and improving the uh, resilience and, and the reliability of the first stage. Um, the first stage is already fairly reliable as is because it's more a function of log4j than it is of the payload that executes against it but people are trying to figure out different ways to trigger it that uh, are stealthier really is, is a lot of what's been going on there um, the part that i'm probably more concerned about is the work that's being done on the second stage payload um, you know as i said before there's a lot of variables that can influence how that payload executes if it's retrieved um, that can cause it to be fragile so as an attacker, the first thing I'm going to try to do is figure out how to make it more robust, more reliable, more predictable. If you, know, if you put yourself in the shoes of the adversary for a second and think about it as building a business on top of this thing, um, you know, on that log4j, um, the expression that I use sometimes that every bug is a startup, like th that's a really good mental model to apply to log4j. Uh, but yeah, it, as a bad guy, I'm going to make that second stage as resilient as I possibly can so that I've got maximum flexibility in terms of, you know, what I'm getting out of a system uh, that I that I managed to attack with this thing. So, <clears throat> you know, at that point, um, seeing it used to deploy ransomware, I think is is conceivable if that's not already happening um, as I'm recording this. Um, I do think that there's going to be some work done on on maturing the exploit before we see some of the more sophisticated operators start to really use it in earnest, like when you go back to WannaCry and, and the inclusion of the internal blue uh, exploit into WannaCry, that took some time uh, between when it was released and when it was actually included. I think we can ex expect to see a similar path here because they don't want to blow their shot. Uh, they, they want to make sure that if they're going to use this thing to, to propagate um, you know, ransomware or other malware, uh, that it's done properly uh, according to their definition um, and that it's successful. So that might take a little bit of time, but once that starts up, I think it's gonna be 
fairly um, exciting to watch at least. And hopefully, you know, there'll be a lot of people that listen to stuff like this uh, that have prepared themselves and will be, you know, minimally impact impacted by that type of thing. Um, the last piece is probably to call out that this is wormable uh, and I'm dating myself by using that term because most things are, or at least are perceived to be these days. But the idea of turning remote code execution into something that's self-propagating, you know, a la WannaCry, a la Emotet and some of the other bits of malware that are out there that can do this. Um, it's, it's very much a, a way that this exploit can be, or this vulnerability can be leveraged by an exploit to be able to more effectively propagate uh, malicious software into systems where it's not meant to be. So, um, you know, that kind of thing happening as a, someone doing it for, for the research lulls, um, you know, a la Blaster and Sasa back in 20, 2003, um, that is possible uh, given how easy it is to work with this thing. It's not that unlikely, um, but I do think the idea of a self-propagating piece of malicious malware with a payload attached that's impactful to a business, um, that's, a highly likely event uh, over the uh, over the next couple of months. So keep an eye out for that. Um, one last piece is that, you know, as I said, I feel like I've said it about 50 times on this thing now, uh, but just to reiterate, uh, Log4j is everywhere. So <clears throat> it, that includes your vendors, uh, you know, organizations whose software you've bought and deployed within your environment. Um, many of them are gonna have Log4j, so you're gonna see patches start to come out from those organizations as they as they fix things. Um, just planning that into your mitigation strategy, I think is really important as well, because that's that stuff always happens at the most inconvenient times. Um, you know, this was not a, th not a Friday, but it was a Thursday, so it's almost Friday. Uh, you know, patches in vendor software tends to follow that same suit. So just being prepared for that, I think is, is wise for organizations to do as well. Um, in terms of how bug crowd can help, you know, uh, asset or, or attack surface management um, especially from the outside in, uh, you know, going back to what I was saying before around like fix your known knowns first and then think about your unknown unknowns. The crowd's very good at finding unknown unknowns. Uh, so that's, that's an area where we can definitely be helpful. Um, for internal testing, some of the private stuff that we're able to do with next generation pen test and, and classic pen test, that could be helpful in identifying previously unknown log4j systems. And I think as well, you know, vulnerability disclosure programs, uh, it's, it's a good time for pretty much everyone to, to start working in earnest on, on starting one of those up because assuming more impact is created off this vulnerability and you know, assuming also that you don't necessarily know who's gonna discover that, having a way for people to tell you and, and having a policy established around how that process works and even having a partner like BugCrowd to help you manage that I think is, is a really important thing to consider at this point in time. So there it is. I know it's been dense. Um, I've tried to, tried to keep this as practical and as, as useful and explanatory as possible. Um, good luck to everyone out there and, and we'll keep y'all up to date with, with things that we're learning as we process like literally the thousands of these we've seen go through the platform already. Uh, you know, some of the stuff that we're, we're learning and understanding around trends and behavior, we'll, we'll keep that information coming so that y'all can be better informed. Um, and yeah, thank you for your time. Cheers.